I step onto the front of the stage seems like a lot higher than it was last week for me. I don't know what's going on. Man, I am um, I'm loving studying about prayers. I'm preparing to preach this series. I think what's been happening to me is God has been opening my eyes to a lot of stuff that I hadn't seen before. And it's really, really cool. I was, um, I was even thinking about just the design and the nature of how God wants to communicate with his people. You know, in, in, the, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve placed in the Garden of Eden, and the Bible talks about how God would show up in the cool of the day, right? What's neat to me about that it is that God was showing up at the same time, and Adam and Eve knew that he was there then. Isn't that neat? The other thing that, that struck me is, as I was reading that passage earlier this week is that it says, they heard God. They heard him. When you, when you go into a place where you meet God, you can hear God. He will speak to you. He will download things into your spirit in a transformative and powerful way. The other thing that, that struck me is I thought about kind of how my prayers go. And, you know, I'm always praying about things, you know, struggles, problems, challenges. And I'm thinking, what did Adam and Eve pray about? There was no sin. They didn't have kids, so it was pretty peaceful around their house, you know. Things were, things were kind of quiet. Like, there was, no, there was no strife in the world. What did they do? They built their relationship with God. That's the foundation of prayer right there. It is about relational interaction with God. It's about relational interaction with God. And, and I also love the fact that throughout Scripture, we see Jesus pray. And, and you, you got to think, you know, man, Jesus was Jesus. Why did he need to pray? Who did, who did he pray to? You know? He prayed to his father. And as we read this passage today, we're going to deal with the Lord's Prayer. And he teaches his disciples, he teaches us how to pray. I also realized this week as I was studying that Jesus at his baptism, when the Bible says that the the Spirit of God descended in, in, um, in John's account of that interaction. We read that when the Spirit descended, the Bible says that Jesus was praying and the Spirit descended. Isn't that cool? I never picked that up. You might have picked it up before. You might have been like, of course, Pastor, I read that the first day. I never picked up on that. And so when I, when I read it, I was like, oh, wow, I never, I never thought about the fact that Jesus was praying He's in communion with the Father, and the Father just sends the Spirit down. So cool. And so as, as we learn about prayer, as we dig into prayer, I want you to learn how to engage God in prayer because this is the difference maker for your life. Prayer is where the victory is won. This week, Mary and I were talking about how hard prayer is, and we, we realize that the reason prayer is hard is because prayer is warfare. Wars are not easy. And prayer is our ability to engage in warfare. Sometime during this series, I plan to talk about Ephesians chapter 6 and how the end of the armor of God talks about praying in the Spirit at all times and on all occasions. That's one of the tools that God has equipped you with in this battle in the heavenlies. And so I want to talk about prayer because I want us as a people of God to be consumed by heaven. I just want us to live with eternity in focus. I want us to live just in the presence of God because when we do, it shifts things. It shifts things not only for you, but more importantly for those around you. Because God didn't place you on earth for you. God placed you on earth for those around you. You're a vehicle that God uses to reach people. So if you've got your Bible with you, 
Luke chapter 11 is where we're going to go. Um, I believe it was last year, maybe February, that I preached a whole sermon series. And I came up with this really creative sermon series title. It was called Pray. Spent a lot of time uh, working that out and um, sat down with the creative team. And we really deliberated, did a lot of whiteboarding and came up with Pray. And so that was the sermon series. Um, it, it's an entire series just on the Lord's Prayer. So as we're going through today, I'm just going to, in one message, kind of hit some highlights from the Lord's Prayer. But I want to encourage you, go back to February last year and look up um, the sermon series Pray. And just, you can do the podcast of it. You can uh, do it on the website. Our website is searchable, by the way. So if you go to um, sermon topics, you can sort by the topic. It makes it real easy to find stuff. And there's some good content on there that I think will help you in your walk with Christ. So I want to start with uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Once Jesus was in a certain place praying. Did you notice that? Jesus was praying. He made it a habit of prayer. It wasn't just something that he did one time. He did it all the time. He was constantly getting away to pray. He was constantly in the face of God, seeking God. And it's interesting to me because even his disciples at one point, Later on in Luke, they're trying to cast out demons, and the demons wouldn't come out. And Jesus walks over and dispatches with the demons in a second, right? And then he says, this kind comes out only through prayer and fasting. So what Jesus is saying is prayer is important. It doesn't matter if you're the son of God with all authority on heaven and earth. You need to be in the face of God praying. You need to be connected with God because that's the only way this spiritual authority comes. If you're not connected to God, don't expect to have spiritual authority. If you are just kind of spiritually lazy, don't expect to have spiritual authority. Authority only comes with being in the presence of God. The other part of this is that it says that he was in a certain place. I want to encourage you, when you pray, get in a specific spot. When, when the scripture says here a certain place, it means a regular place. It was a place that Jesus frequented. The disciples knew that they could find him in this certain place. That's where he would get away to very often. And so the disciples are kind of eavesdropping on this prayer that Jesus is praying. As Jesus is spending time communing with the Father, the disciples are eavesdropping. And it says, as he finished, one of his disciples came and said... Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said, nah, don't worry about it, guys. It's just talking to God. Don't worry about it. Doesn't say that, right? Jesus teaches them to pray. Last week, remember I said, I said prayer is talking to God, but prayer isn't just talking to God, right? We under value the power of prayer when we say it's just talking to God. As if it's some kind of small talk. It's talking about the weather. It's talking about the craziness of the coronavirus. That's not what Jesus does. So the implication is when the disciples are watching Jesus pray, they've identified something in him that's different than what they've seen from anybody else. And as they watch him, it's not like the Pharisees and the Sadducees that, that have these big prayers that are public and out there. Jesus is having this prayer time with the Father that is so different and stands in stark contrast. And so the disciples look at him and they're like, I don't think we're doing it that way. Can you teach us how to pray? The implication is we think we're doing it wrong. Would you teach us how to do it right? And can I tell you, Jesus isn't afraid to tell you you're praying wrong. Let me show you how. Right? And do you know if the disciples that walked with Jesus for three years 
didn't know how to pray, there's a good chance you may be doing it wrong too. Is that okay? Right? Is that okay if we can just admit, hey, we're struggling in our prayer life. We need some help. We need some tips from the master on how to pray effectively so that we can break through into heaven and so that heaven can break through in us so that we can be breakthrough agents in the world around us. That's what we need. We don't need little, oh shoot, the police are about to pull me over prayers. Right? We don't need the little pledge allegiance to the flag prayers that we pray before we eat. We don't need all of these little rehearsed prayers that really are ineffectual and inconsequential because they're not really about us trying to communicate with God, but rather they're about us trying to check a box that says, yeah, I prayed before my meal. Yeah, I prayed before I went to bed. Yay me, I've done my religious duty for the day. If that's what prayer is, it's wrong. You might as well just keep a lucky rabbit's foot on your keychain because it's about as effective. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. That's what we need, right? So Jesus begins the instruction. Jesus begins the instruction. It says, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. To which all of you say, Pastor, you read it wrong. (laughs) That's not how it goes. It's... It's our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If, you're, if you know it, say it with me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, big finish, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You guys got, now you are feeling it, right? You are feeling it. The problem is, is that Luke doesn't say it that way. So there are two different occasions in which Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer. Did you know that? One is in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. One is Luke chapter 11 when his disciples are eavesdropping on his prayer life. Both are occasions when Jesus thought it was important to teach on how to pray. Both times he gave a similar pattern on how to pray, but it was not word for word the same thing. So that gives us the idea that it wasn't an intended prayer that you repeat and write down and memorize and say over and over and over and over and over again. But it was a pattern for how you should pray, a pattern for how you should approach God, a pattern for how you interact with God in order to be most effective in what you do. So that's why I started with Luke because I knew that when I read it, it messed me up because I was like, no, wait, I'm reading the wrong version. And I flipped over to the NIV and the NIV gave me a similar version. And I flipped over to the King James version. I was like, man, the King James version even got it screwed up here. This isn't right, right? And so, so as I was studying this thing, I said, man, we need to learn how to pray. And, and the whole foundation of this thing is relationship. It's relationship. How does Jesus say to start? He says, Father in heaven. It is relational in nature. It's not great king of heaven. It's not priest of heaven. It's not mighty one on the throne. It's our Father. There is a relational nature to the way that Jesus prays that draws the disciples in because up to this point, they have felt utterly separate from God. Only the priest could go into the presence of God. 
So how do we approach God? How do we pray? It's, it's so formal and it's so like I watch the priests do it and they, they do their thing and I'm not sure that I know how to do that and I feel disconnected with God. And, and Jesus says, but I'm Emmanuel, God with you and I want to show you how to relate to my Father. That's the reason I came. Isn't this cool? And so Jesus begins to show them, and he's like, look, this is the way you do it. You don't approach him as if he's some distant, far-off God that you can't get to. You approach him as if he's your father. And now, I realize that for some of you, that's a stumbling block. For some of you, that's not a helpful image of God because you haven't had a good relationship with your dad. And so the idea of relating to God as father for you is very, very difficult. It doesn't cause you to want to draw in. It causes you to want to push back. And I recognize that for some of you, that's the case, and it's difficult. But let me tell you something. Think about your best possible version of a dad. The dad that you never had, but you always wish you did. God's a thousand times more than that. And as you start to picture it, as you start to recognize it, you'll start to get to that place of drawing close. And I would encourage you, seek God where you are. Don't try to seek God down the road some way. If you've got an issue with your dad that serves as a roadblock to your relationship with your heavenly father, you got to deal with that at some point. You know that, right? In order for your life in Christ to grow and be strengthened, you're going to have to move past the wounds that your father gave you. There are a lot of people that struggle in life because of wounds they've received from their father. And when you seek God and you sit down and you begin to pray this prayer, and I'm going to encourage you, open your Bible and read this prayer as you pray. And you start and you say, our father in heaven. And you stop for a second. And you say, God i got to be honest with you. I am struggling with relating to you as my father. I've got such a horrible relationship with my dad. You know what he did to me. I am so mad at him. He hurt me so much. You take that to God. And you let that just ooze out of you as you pray. And you watch what God starts to do in you. And he will start to tear down those barriers. He will start to break that stuff apart. And you'll start to experience a level of freedom. And the things that used to hold you captive as you think about your dad will no longer bind you. Because your heavenly father becomes more than your earthly father ever could. And he starts to redeem all of those past transgressions of your father. Man, this is good news, guys. And if you have a great relationship with your dad, say, God, thank you that my dad lived out a way that I can relate to you. I think about those moments with my dad where I just sat next to him and I I put my head on his chest and he put his arm around me. And we just sat there and snuggled for a minute and watched a little TV. I remember being out in the backyard with my dad and he played catch with me. And I remember laughing and him kind of teasing me as I, I dropped the ball and he messed with me. I remember those moments and God, I can see you in him. Praise God for those. But Jesus is saying, I want you to relate to God. So I'm going to give you a handle on how to relate to God. I want you to say, Father. And the word that's used here is Abba. And it's, it's a very familiar term. I've heard people say it means daddy. It, it could mean daddy. The reality is, though, it's just a very familiar, non pretentious, non-formal way for a child to call out their dad. If it's comforting to you to say, Daddy, when you talk to God, say, Daddy. If it helps you relate to him more, do that. The point that Jesus is making is, I want you to relate to your heavenly Father. I want you to live in fellowship with him. Amen? And so... 
Jesus puts a very high priority on relationship with God. And as he's teaching his disciples this, he's showing them effective ways to communicate. So now I want you to flip back over because I don't want to mess you up too much. So let's go over to Matthew chapter 6. This is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus teaches everybody that's there in earshot how to pray. And so as he's teaching, he gives the very familiar version. And it's verse 9 says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Now I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, so if that's not the version that you're familiar with, just adapt. But that's what I'm reading out of. It's very easy to understand, very a uh, good translation of the Bible without being a paraphrase. And it's, so I, I like though, and I'm, this is the last thing I'm gonna camp out on in this first piece. But he says, our Father in heaven. You notice it's not my Father. It's not my Father. You're not an only child. You're a part of a kingdom family. And your prayers affect the people around you. And so when you pray, it's not selfish, it's not just you focused, it's our Father. Jesus is very deliberate about the terms that he uses as he's teaching them how to pray. And so he says, hallowed be thy name, holy be your name. Your name is elevated, your name is above every name. And now, here's the thing. You, you guys have all been around people that before they're going to ask you for something, they hit you up and, and, and talk all positive about you, right? They're kind of trying to butter you up for the big ask. You've been around people like that? Man, you're awesome. I love hanging out with you. Man, you just, I, you just so, you're so easy to be with. Dude, can I have 50 bucks? No, I'll hit you up next week. No, I'm serious. I'll hit you up next week. I got, I got it. When my check comes in, I'll get you right? You know what I'm talking about? That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing here is we're putting God in his proper place. One of the, one of the causes of, I believe it's A.W. Tozer that says that the cause of many sins is a low view of God, right? And so because we've kind of reduced God down to this little pocket-sized Jesus that we can carry with us wherever we want to go, and when we need him, we can pull him out and use him. And whenever we don't want him, we can put him back in our pocket and do what we want to do. Right? You get a little pocket Jesus to go with you. And the great thing is, if you got a little pocket Jesus, you can go to that party and you can put him in your pocket when you're at the party. And then you can go out and you can have fun and you can do everything crazy you want. And then on the way home, you pull pocket Jesus out, set him back on the dashboard to help you in case the police pull you over. See, but that's the wrong kind of Jesus. That's a Jesus that's made in your image instead of you being a person who's made in his image. And that's a big problem with people that call themselves believers in the 21st century is that we refuse to live as though we are made in the image of God and we choose to try to force God to live in the image of us. So we rearrange the Bible and we rewrite the Bible to make it fit us because we want to do this and we like to do this and we feel this way and this is how we were made to behave and this is how we were made to think and you don't understand, but my parents have always done this and I have an Irish temper, and Right? And we'll use every excuse that we can think of to make God in our own image. God does not operate that way. And so when we enter his presence and we say, our Father, holy is your name. You are set apart. You are great. You are high and lifted up. You sit on the throne of heaven. The world is your footstool. Everything is under your feet. There is nothing too great for you. Your word says that I can speak to a mountain and it'll be thrown into the sea. Your word says that, that there is nothing that is too great that you can't accomplish it. So we just lean into you. As we pray, as we seek your face, God, we put you in your place. And as we do that, 
what starts to happen to your problems. Your problems become pocket-sized. When your God is full-sized, your problems become pocket-sized. How many of you would rather have pocket-sized problem and heaven-enthroned God? Or would you rather have giant problems and a pocket-sized Jesus that you can control the way you want? You can have this whole world, but give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. I just want to stop for a second. Jesus, I want you. Lord, we are a church that declares this morning, we want you. We want you. There is nothing else besides you. God, we need you. We are desperate for you, God. We wish that you would help us. We ask that you would deliver us, Lord, to think like you, to walk like you, to pursue you, that you would be the sole source of everything that we desire, God. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Man, there are sometimes, guys, we just got to stop and say, God, we need you. We need you. I remember when I was a kid, there was a guy in our neighborhood. He was about four years older than me, and he scared the life out of me. He, uh, he, he was, you know, kind of the stereotypical. When I was a teenager, we had the guys that were, um, that we're using and smoking. And you know you, how you have little class groups? You have a little caste system in high school, right? And you've got the jocks, right? And then you got the preps. And then you got the nerds. And then, right, you got all of the, you, you, we got the little caste system. And then when I was a teenager, we had the group that we called the burnouts, right? How many of you remember that terminology? Okay, only like three people, good. That's good. That's good. Some of you are too old to, to know about it, and some of you are too young to remember it. And so, so we just, the four of us, would just band together and say, yes, I remember burnouts. This guy fell into the category of burnout, and he, he wore the jean jacket, and he was, you know, smoke pot, and he would walk to the neighborhood. And every time he walked by my house, if I was outside, he would give me the middle finger and say every kind of vulgar thing that you could imagine to me. And he scared the life out of me. And I would just like run into the garage, run into the house, be like, no, nah, not today, Satan, you know? And, and one day, this dude is going by and my dad was in the driveway and my dad came around the corner just as this kid's giving me the finger and cussing me. And my dad took it personally. And this kid gives the, and my dad is not a big man. But when this dude comes running at you full speed, you should probably run. My dad takes off running after this kid. I have no idea what he was planning to do when he caught this kid. But he takes off running, chases this kid for like six blocks to his house. The kid runs inside, leaves the front door open, slams the screen door. My dad opens the door and goes inside and his mom and dad are sitting on the couch inside. And my dad walks in, he's got like the carotid artery and the, the jugular, it's like pulsing out of his neck. He is beet red and he says, your son attacked me and my son personally today. And if he ever gives me the finger or cusses me, I will break his finger off. Now, my dad is a man of God. It takes a lot to get my, my dad to do, but my dad was not going to be disrespected and he was going to take a stand. Can I tell you something? When, it, when the enemy comes by and starts to taunt you, and starts to, to castigate you, and starts to say all kinds of things about you, and as he mocks you, your father is waiting around the corner. And if you stay in close connection with him, he will chase your enemy down. And he will go into the enemy's house, and he will kick down the door if he has to. And he will confront anybody that he needs to in order to say, leave my kids alone. Thank you, Dad. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. And we just threw the first verse here. Whoo! Can you feel this today? Can you feel this? This is what God designed for you. Now listen to 10. He says, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come soon. How many of you are ready? Man, I am ready for the kingdom of God to come soon. There are days when I wake up and I'm like, today, Lord, if you came today, it would be awesome. I'm not one of these people that's scared and intimidated about the return of Christ. I am stoked about the return of Christ. I read a verse, I don't even remember where it was this week. I read a verse in the translation I was reading out of. It said, the skies were ripped open. Don't you love that? I just see Jesus waiting in heaven, like with all of the angel armies, and he's ready. He's like, God, as soon as you give the command, Father, as soon as you tell me, I am going to rip the skies open and I'm going after my bride. I cannot wait to get there. I cannot wait to be with my people. This is the reunion. This is the moment. This is the time that was set aside. This is why I endured the cross. This is what the resurrection is about. I cannot wait to rip heaven open. This is the moment. May your kingdom come soon. Now here's the part that becomes problematic. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the tough part, right? God, your will be done. Because when we pray, most of the time it's, God, our will be done. Let me tell you what I need from you. Let me tell you what I got for you. Let me tell you how you can hook me up today. Let me tell you what I need you to do. God, here's my checklist for heaven. But when we get to the your will, will be done part. That's the hard part. See, because if we were honest and we were really praying this prayer, it would be something like, our kingdom come, our will be done on earth, and who gives a rip about heaven? Give me this day everything that I can consume, everything that I ever wanted, and lead me not into temptation because I can find it all by myself. Right? That would be a little bit more honest prayer. But this is the wrestling match of prayer. This is where God gives you the permission to wrestle with heaven over your will and his will. This is where the real work of relational prayer takes place. Because this is the place where we're honest with God. This is the place where we say, God, I don't like the way you're doing things. Did you know that God is okay with that? He is not offended by your wants, wishes, and desires. He's not intimidated if you don't like the way he does things. It's not going to like cause the, the lights in heaven to dim a little bit if you say, God, I don't want it this way. I don't like this. I'm wrestling with you over this. It's okay. Can, can you imagine if your kids came to you when they wanted something, and they said, Dad, look, I, this is what I really want. But here's the deal. I know that you've lived a lot of life, and, and you have wisdom that is beyond my years. And so whatever you decide to do, Dad, I'm just going to sync up with you. Whatever you decide, I'm with you. Okay, so after they wake you up from fainting, you would say, Wow. That was very mature. Wow. What kind of child did I raise? Look at this kid. Look at this kid. Because this is ultimately what God is after. He's he's after you saying, God, here's what I want. Here's my desires. Here's what I'm going after. This is what I think is best. But God, I defer to you. Whatever your will is, that's my will. That's what I want. Because God, you are so much higher than I am. 
You are so much wiser than I am. I can't begin to comprehend your ways. Now, I'm not saying do that in this weird little false humility way that we like to do, right? Where we're pretending. Why would you, in your private prayer closet, be pretentious with God? Like, I get it if there's some public pretension. We all struggle with that sometimes, right? We, we all, you know, I, I saw a meme the other day that said, I don't know why everybody's so upset about wearing masks to church. They've been doing that for years. Right? We're all guilty of wearing masks. And so here's, here's the deal. Why, in your private prayer time, would you try to wear a mask in front of the God of the universe who already sees behind it? He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows what your heart is. So why act like you're just like, okay, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. Well, God's like, no, you don't. You couldn't even get up and read your Bible this morning. What are you talking about, whatever my will is? Like you snooze the alarm 14 times. What are you, where, my will, what are you talking about? Stop playing. If you don't want what God wants, be honest with God and say, God, I'm struggling to want what you want. I'm still in this place where I want what I want. Like I know that ultimately I want a good marriage, but she's hot. And I'm lonely. Right? Come on, like, that's real talk with God. And God is okay with real talk. He hates pretentious, hypocritical talk, especially in your private life. Especially in your quiet time with God. If there is ever a time to lay it all out and say, God, here I am. I'm going to expose myself to the degree that I know myself. Because there's parts of you that you don't know. And you think that you're being honest with God, but if you really looked hard, you would realize that you are not. You're not even being honest with yourself. And so God wants you to be open with him and reveal yourself to him to the degree that you know yourself. But if you're not serious about, yes, God, I want what you want, then hang out here for a while. This is so cool. I, I love... I love how, how Jesus, in John chapter 11, verse 41, he, he's, he's getting ready to raise Lazarus from the dead, right? How many of you have ever raised someone from the dead? Raise your hand. Nobody? So I must be in an exclusive group, and I'm the only, no, I'm just kidding, I've never done that either. But like, you would think that would require a lot of prayer, right? But if you flip over, I'm gonna put my bottle cap on Matthew 6, and I'm going to flip over to John chapter 11. I want to read this to you because it's almost, it's almost bizarre as you read this account. If you don't bring a Bible to church, I encourage you to do it because there is power in the crinkling of pages. Listen to this. This does not have the same impact on my spirit as... It just sounds good. We should do that. What do they call that? The, the sensory? ASMR. Yeah, teenagers know that. It's, but it's people that do this in a microphone on YouTube, and people watch it. They'll just be like, and they'll be like, why? I'm just going to throw this out there. You desperately need Jesus, Okay. If that's what you're doing, like you're on YouTube, like, listen to that. What? Get in your prayer closet right now. You need Jesus, and you got too much time on your hands. All right, so here we are. Listen to this. That's even free. I'm not even, like, that's not even Bible stuff right there. That was just free life lessons. So here we are. Verse 41, it says, So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father... Thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out! The end. Like, really? 
That's Jesus. Like he's getting ready to raise somebody from the dead. And he doesn't, there's no like, oh God, I beseech thee in the powerful name. That is above every name. He doesn't even add syllables to the ends of his words. Like, man, if you're going to raise somebody from the dead, you should probably at least add a couple extra syllables in there. You probably should get loud, right? You might ought to scream. But Jesus, he's just like, Father, I know you hear me because you always hear me. I'm actually only saying anything at all because I want them to know that you and I are connected. The end. Lazarus! Come out. And he does. Here comes Lazarus. And everybody's like, oh. And Jesus is like, do you unwrap him, please? We got some stuff to do. I'm hungry. Are you guys hungry? I'm ready to get some dinner. You got, hey, Mary, Martha, you got some food? Because we want to go head back to the house. I know there was going to be a wake, you know, and they were going to do a big spread and everything. So we just, we're just going to have a potluck. Yes, this is what we do. We're Christians. Christians love to eat. Come on. Right? And so, so like that was, that was the thing. And you're just like, man, he just raised Lazarus from the dead. And it was just like, no big deal. Here we go. One of the things that I do notice from this, by the way, I think there are a lot of things that we pray for that we need to speak to. Because God's already given you authority over it, but you're not really latching into the authority. Do you ever notice that when Jesus walked around healing people, he never prayed for them? Did you ever notice that? Jesus never once prayed for people as he's healing them. He just says, pick up your mat, walk. He just says, go show yourself to the priest. He, he, it's not, he doesn't even flinch. He's just like, yeah, what do you want? Oh, you want to see? Okay. Well, now you can see. Like on rare occasions, he does this little thing where, where he'll like do something weird just to like make people watch. So it'll be like, Come here, let me stick this in your eye. And everybody's like, what's he doing? Go wash your eyes out. Uh, okay, I can see. <laughs> like, the stuff that you, but there's no big prayers. There's no crazy, like, out there. It's just, and the disciples do the same thing. If you read the book of Acts, all the way through the book of Acts, there's a, this occasion where, where Peter's going to raise somebody from the dead. And he prays, but he doesn't pray that she'll be raised from the dead. He prays for faith. He spends time, he dismisses everybody in the room that has no faith. And then he prays until his faith level is high enough. And then he just speaks to her. And she rises from the dead. That's kind of cool, I guess. You know, a little... You got Peter walking down the street and his shadow's touching people. And they're like, hey, I can walk. Are you serious right now? This is the fruit of living in communion, fellowship, relationship with God. And anything less than that, guys, we're settling. We're settling. I believe that we are settling because we don't walk in authority. I, I struggle with this, guys. I've, I've been able to see miracles. I've seen miracle signs and wonders over the last year that have been awesome. We've watched as God's healed people right here in this room. I've prayed with people on the street that have been healed. It's been cool. But I, it needs to be an all-the-time occurrence. It doesn't need to be the exception to the rule. It needs to be the rule. We need to see it in the body of Christ where we just speak and people are healed. Where we speak and demons come out. We need to be in that place where God is moving through us because we're living in communion and fellowship with our Heavenly Father. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Where do we see Jesus really pray for a long time? Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's about to go to the cross. And how long does he pray? All night long. 
And he asked his disciples, hey guys, can you just hang with me for an hour? Can you hang with me for an hour? And they're like, no, we're tired. We'll fall asleep. So here's the deal. What does Jesus do? What is Jesus praying about? He says, God, I don't want to go to the cross. I don't like the idea of the cross. The cross is going to hurt. The cross is going to be bloody. The cross is going to be painful. I do not want to endure the ridicule. I do not want to endure the persecution. I do not want to be mocked. I don't want to be paraded around nude. I don't want to be beaten. I know it's coming. I don't want it. God, if there's any other way, will you please do it? And he prays and he grieves. And the Bible says that, that the capillaries in his, in his forehead begin to break and the sweat begins to form with droplets of blood in it and run off of his face as he's praying because he's in such agony of prayer. What's he wrestling with? Not my will, but yours be done. This is the wrestling match of prayer, guys. It's about will. It's about my will in submission to his will. And when we get to that place where we can wrestle with God's will and say, yes, Lord, I'm going to submit. Yes, I'm with you, Lord. That's when things start to change. That's when things start to change. Verse 11 says, give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. This is so significant. Because Jesus uses the term daily bread to hearken back to a time where Israel is in the desert and they had no food and they depended on God for their daily bread. They needed him to provide every day or they were going to die. I think sometimes in the American church, one of the things that we struggle with is that we don't need that much from God. Like, God, I'm good. I'm set. I got a paycheck. Why do I need you? We would never say that. Because we would be afraid we're struck by lightning, right? But the attitude of our heart is, I don't really need to pray that much. I'm good. I don't need to spend that much time in the presence of God. I'm good. I got what I need. I'm set. No, you're not. And you missed the entire point. And this is the reason why Jesus said it's harder for uh, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven right? Why is that the case? Because we become dependent on our stuff instead of dependent on our God. And God wants us in a place of dependence. God wants us in a place of faith. God wants us in a place of desperation. And sometimes we don't find ourselves desperate because we have enough. Can I tell you something, guys? I've been desperate for finances. I've been desperate because they were about to repossess my car. I've been desperate because I lost my house. I've been desperate because I didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. Literally didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. And I had two babies. And I didn't know how we were going to be able to feed them because there wasn't enough money. And I was tired of asking people for help because it's embarrassing to ask people to help you. And I would lay awake at night and cry and ask God, please, God, please, please help us. I know you see us, but please help us. Those were desperate times. But do you know, those were some of the deepest times of faith that I've ever had. Those were some of the deepest moments where I saw God come through. Those were some of the greatest times in my spiritual life because God showed himself faithful over and over and over and over again. And the beautiful thing about God allowing us to ask for things is that he has given us a need for him. And because we have a need for him, our faith rises up. We grow. It's so powerful. So don't lead us into, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one the end. Isn't it interesting that it just stops there? If you read your Bible, the only 
Bible versions that have, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, is the King James and the New King James. No other versions contain those words. And the reason is because when the King James was written, the manuscripts that they had were dated back to about 300 AD. So that's, that's 300 years after, or 200 years or so after it was written and published. And now we have older source documents that trace back to around 115, 120 that were closer to the original manuscript. And what happened over time is that scribes would add things because they thought it sounded a little bit better. So the thing with Bible translation and Bible translations is that the, the more discoveries, the more archaeological finds that we have, the more source documents that we have, and the more we're able to kind of measure text and compare them to each other, okay? And so we have things, and so like in your Bible, it may say, it may say in your Bible that, hey, that's not included in this passage, or that's not included in the oldest manuscripts. Well, that's because it wasn't there. And so if Jesus is teaching us to pray, clearly we need to put an amen on the end of it, right? And if, if you're doing a wedding ceremony, you don't want to like be, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You may kiss the bride, right? Because <laughs> that, that would just be weird, and your wife would probably get the wrong idea, right? So, and if, if they're going to sing it at a wedding, you got to have the big finish, you know? You, you got to have the big finish at the end. This is going to be, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the, right? You got to have that whole, you can't just deliver us from evil. You, you got to have that ending. And so, so in the King James, it's included there. And, and just let me pause there for a second. There are people that believe that the King James Version is the only authorized version of the Bible. The King James Version is a fine translation of the Bible. It's, it's a good translation. Most of it is, is solid. There are a few things, like I said, with source documents that they found more recently. Obviously, if something was written in 1600, there's been a lot that's happened in the last 400 years in terms of archaeological discovery, right? So we have more source documents. The King James is fine, but if anybody ever tries to persuade you that the King James is the only version and that it was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for you, it's, it's okay to push back to that a little bit, okay? King James is fine, but King James is not the only, okay? So just, just know that. Because Paul didn't read English, just so everybody knows. And Paul didn't have access to a King James Version. So, just so everyone knows. That was about uh, 1,500 years or so after Paul died. So, just if you need to clarify with anybody, you got that in your back pocket. Along with your pocket Jesus if you need him. All right, so, so as we look at this thing, I, I'm, I'm going to try to land the plane here. I got four more pages of notes. So let me just get my head wrapped around this for a second. The big thing I want you to walk away with is I want you to get to this place where you can declare God's greatness at the beginning of your prayer. And at the end of your prayer, you can acknowledge your dependence on him, right? And those are the two easiest pieces of the puzzle. Right? Declare the glory, acknowledge dependence. Those, those two. The middle section is the tough section, and that is the surrender your will section. Can I encourage you? Dig in there. Dig in there. Surrender your will. Surrender your will. I want to give you something that I think is important, and it's not even really that deep, but... I need you to understand something. When you choose not to surrender your will to God, it doesn't really affect anything. You realize that, right? You not surrendering your will to God only impacts you. It doesn't impact God. It's not like God is greatly offended and he's sitting in the corner in heaven crying saying, I, I just wish Brad would get on board and surrender his will to me. This is so hard. Like, that's not what God's doing, right? God is good. He's, he's good whether you're good or not. 
He's got it together. So here's the thing, though. Here's why wrestling with God is so important, because what we do is we get a hold of something and we just hold on to it for dear life, right? Whether it's relationships or whether it's money, that's why some people have such a hard time with tithing is because it's like, I'm going to hold on to this because I can control it and I need it and I got this and what if I give this to God and the things don't work out, right? And, and can I tell you a secret? God doesn't need your money. He's okay. And he will go on without what's in your bank account. But what God is after is not what's in your hands. He's after what's in your heart. But in order for God to get to your heart, you got to be willing to let go. Because you will never be able to receive what God has for you if you've got clenched fists. It's impossible. It's impossible to receive what God has for you if you're fists are clenched, holding on to stuff. If, if I were to give you something and you reached out to receive it like this, it would fall on the ground, wouldn't it? In order to receive what I have for you, you would have to open your hands and say, okay, I'm going to take it. Thank you. I want you to get that because that's what wrestling with God is all about. It's to to pry your little fingers loose from whatever you're holding on to that is holding you back from receiving everything that God wants for you. It's not, it's not to your benefit that you're holding on to stuff. You know that, right? It is to your detriment. But God, this guy may be the last train out of singleness. What if... Instead of holding on to that relationship, you said, God, not only do I surrender him to you, but I surrender all future relationships to you because I want to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And I know that everything else will be added unto me. And I'm not worried about it. And if there's never a guy, if there's never a girl, I am okay in you and I have everything that I need in you because I am not broken. I am not half. I don't need somebody else to make me whole. I am whole in you and I will only be more fulfilled in you with the person that you've designed for me. I could preach that right there. There's this misconception that the way to a man's heart is through his, what? Stomach. Now, looking at me, you might believe that's true, but it is not true. The way to a man's heart is through his pocketbook. Right? Guys want stuff. The reality is we all pretty much want stuff. We all wrestle with wanting to accumulate and get and have and possess and buy and buy and buy and buy. God says, I wish you would just let that stuff go. I wish you would just relax and know that you have enough because you have me. See, because it's an insult to God when we try to fill all the little holes in our hearts with stuff and we try to make our lives more peaceful, our lives better by bringing more stuff into our life. And God says, I'm all you need. I'm all you need. What would it be like if you went today into a quiet place with God and just said, God, today, I'm going to give you eight out of ten. I feel like that's all I've got today. I'm going to give you eight out of ten. And God, I'm going to wrestle with you over two. I don't, I don't feel like I have it in the tank. I don't feel that spiritual. Uh, like, God, you know me better than anybody else knows me, and you know I am not that spiritual. So, God, when I'm with you, I'm not going to pretend to be spiritual. I'm just going to try to build a relationship with you because I recognize my need for you. I, everything else in this world that I've tried continues to come up empty. 
I know that you're the only thing that will satisfy. And so I'm going to just spend time in your presence, God. I just want you. I want you. How would that shift things if every day you made a little time to do that? How would that change things for you? I want you this week to just get this out. I want you to wrestle with God. I want you to approach him. I want you to elevate him. And then I want you to wrestle with him over your will. And then I want you to declare your dependence on him. And if you want to end the prayer with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, you can. He's not going to be mad at you. And if you feel guilty over it, just blame King James. It's okay. But get in the presence of God. Get in the face of God. Here's what I've learned about me. When I'm more intentional about praying, I tend to carry the conversation with God throughout my day. When I'm intentional in the morning about getting with God, I tend to find myself unconsciously just like, God, thank you for the day. You know, I just, like there's a heart of gratitude that wells up and I just find myself carrying it through the day. It's the way it works. And that's the goal. Paul says we're to pray continually, right? So I want you to be in the presence of God. So today, as we close, I'm going to close in prayer. I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus and you're hearing me talk about relationship with Jesus, it is not hard to enter into a relationship with Jesus. You just say, God, I believe. I believe. Like today, I could hear as the pastor was preaching. I know that you are who you say you are. I just felt a, a switch flip in my spirit, and I want you, Lord. If that's you today, just dig in. Welcome to the family of God. God will, the Bible says, forgive your sins. Just say, Lord, forgive me. You see how messed up I am? Forgive me, please, Lord. And he will do it. So God, today, as we close in prayer, we just say, our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, we understand that in the context of everything that we've just studied. And Lord, to that we say, Amen.